Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm Christopher from um, CED Magazine, sir. Yes. So, uh, we congratulate you on uh, your selection as um, one of those uh, youth environment professionals sir, to be recognized as um, Nigeria Max at the 60th uh, Independence uh, Celebration, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we have uh, some questions for you, sir, that we need uh, to be addressed by you, sir, being a professional in this field for, the, for, for many decades now, sir. Okay. No. All right, uh, the first question is, um, speak, uh, speak on Nigerian infrastructure goods since independence and what have what we have gained and what we miss? Uh, what's the question? Speak on Nigerians' infrastructure groups since independence and what we have gained and what we missed. Infrastructure what? Groups. Group. Sorry? Infrastructure groups. Groups. Ah, okay. Yes, sir. G-R-O-W-T-H. Infrastructure growth. Since and, independence. Uh, what we've missed. And what we gained. We've missed since independence. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. That's the first question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the second question, as a professional, an operator in the infrastructure value chain, speak uh, specifically about your sector and the growth trajectory. As a professional in uh, the, sorry? As a professional and uh, operator. As professional and operator, yeah. In the infrastructure value chain. In the infrastructure value chain. Speak. I hope you know, I'm writing this down, so that's why I'm repeating it. First, yes. Sir. Value chain, value chain, yeah. Speak specifically about your sector. Speak specifically Kelly, about your sector. And the growth trajectory. And uh, the growth tra trajectory. Trajectory. Okay. And number three, uh, speak on your contribution to the growth trajectory, either as a professional and or investor in the sector. Contribution to the growth trajectory trajectory either as a professional a professional or investor in the sector or investor in the sector that's an awful okay let me ask this is the last one sir Speak uh, one more again. No, it's just uh, one. Talk, Benny. It's just one, sir. This one is very important, sir. <laughs> They're uh, all important. Yes, sir. Speak on your contribution to the development of Abuja City from the scratch. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> contribution to Abuja. City from the scratch to CH. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, what's your name? Christopher. Christopher. Oh, are you the gentleman who's been calling me? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Okay, nice to meet you, finally. Okay, Christopher, my apologies, first of all, for the various, um, um, you know, miss-ups. You didn't, did you introduce me? You didn't introduce me. Or you, you do that later? 
Okay, yeah, I'll do that later, sir. Okay, I hope you got my correct designation. Yes, sir. That's, uh, okay, we are on Very. to uh, architect Dr. Uh, Larry Tarikoka, F R I B A F N I A M A Law, UK, PhD. Very good. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Now, going to, looking at uh, question number one, the questions are all related apart from question number four. Uh, and I want to be as precise and as concise as possible. Um, my apologies, just one second. Um, right. Now, in our uh, summation of the Nigerian infrastructure uh, growth, what were what we've missed yes, uh, since independence? Yes, hmm? sir. Yes, sir. Nigerian infrastructure growth and what we missed. Since, uh, well, first of all, I wasn't here it, during independence, so I don't know what they had during independence. Um, I left. Nigeria uh, before independence. I left Nigeria, uh, you know, at a very early age in 1953. So I didn't know what they had in independence. All I remember when I left Lagos Island, because I'm from Lagos Island, is the fact that uh, in Lagos Island we had street lights. Yes, sir. In Lagos Island we have running water. Yes. In my area of Lagos Island, in Latiaji. Uh, we had uh, yeah, we run water. We have water taps in this in the center of the town uh, around my area in Lafayette. Uh, we had uh, clean drains. I remember that very well because as a as a school, as a small child, we used to play with boats with our with our uh, paper boats in the drains. So they must have been clean. Uh, and I remember. Lagos Island being very clean. In fact, my cousins in Lafayette, the Sagos, used to grow grapes in Forsyth Street. I'm sure you won't even believe that was yeah. possible. They actually had grapes. Wow. So that's what I remember of Lagos Island. And even Yaba, where my mother lived, I remember Yaba to be a very, uh, very uh, sort of slightly tree lined. Avenue. It was called Baddeley Avenue, and uh, lots of trees there. Same thing with the Onikon. There were lots of trees in Onikon, and um, uh, you know we had uh, the the race course, which was also full of trees and all that. All I remember was Lagos was, was full of trees, and there was a lot of breeze. Uh, the boats used to come to the marina before they expanded it. Um, but coming back, um, finally in 75, 74, 75, uh, there were great opportunities for people in the infrastructure industry, architects, uh, civil structural engineers, mechanical electrical engineers, consultants, and people who were trained in those industries, in those fields. And I remember that uh, my seniors, when I used to come home on holiday, uh, were running organizations like LSDPC and so forth. And they were the, fir the first generation Nigerian architects who returned from the UK. They were my seniors. And they did a lot of work. They were hardworking people like late J.S.K. McGregor, late Akin Craig, late Dr. Dan Eduawani, late Ulumiwa, and so on. They were the ones, people who planned uh, Surulere and all the um, rehab re rehabilitation um, uh, estates or towns after the Lagos Island was reclaimed uh, in Reclamation Street and so on uh, after the plague, bubonic plague, that's when they set up LSTPC. Nice. And, um, and uh, that's when they actually planned Surulere. And you can see they did a fairly good job in Surulere because the Surulere, all the streets connect. Uh, unlike uh, Lekki, where the streets do not connect. So you can see the difference between the first generation of Nigerian architects and planners yes. and those who came two or three generations after them. Um, because those who came from the UK uh, were properly trained. Uh, with due respect to everybody locally trained people, you find that um, 
there's a lot missing, not due to their own fault, but due to the fact that the academic system is not what it used to be. You don't have uh, the uh, lecturers who are actually practitioners. In any professional field, you must have, your lecturers must always be practitioners. Otherwise, what are they teaching you? Yes. You can't just learn theory. It's and like, in, um, it's, yes, in my university in England, all my professors were practicing architects. Wow. So if you're not a practicing architect, what are you going to be teaching a student? Uh, just the theory? And I think that's one of the problems that that has bedeviled uh, yeah. Nigerian professionals uh, since independence, since you talk about independence. But one thing I must say is that uh, in the 70s, when I came back, started my practice in 1976, I was very fortunate in the sense that uh, being a Lagosian, I was also from Lagos Island, I was also particularly well connected. And uh, having been British trained, that made it even better for me because we were using a British system for everything. So I would say, compared to our, uh, shall I say, our peers in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, South Korea, I would say we've not done very well. I would say we've not done very well. We've not, we've not adhered to any particular um, formula. We've not adhered to any particular master plan. A master plan was done during the uh, go go gubernatorial, uh, during the mil first military government in Lagos in 1967. And that master plan has still not been fully um, completed or even started upon. Dolphin was supposed to be an area which is supposed to be lined with canals and, and all that kind of thing for people to be uh, accessing to the lagoon. Those are the kind of master plans that uh, we had during the time of uh, uh, Brigadier Johnson up to when there was a, you know, a military coup, yeah. I believe in 77. Uh, yeah, 77 or was it? Yeah, 77, 76. Um, I think it was 77. Okay. Um, so there was a trajectory, forward trajectory, where we had, we didn't have as many states as we have now. And uh, each military governor was uh, alive to his responsibilities because it was a, you know, a kind of unitary system in those days. Um, I would say we cannot compare with our peers. I would say if we were going to give ourselves a pass mark compared to our peers, we can't just be comparing ourselves with ourselves. We have to compare ourselves with our peers, those who were on par with us in 1960 and where they are today. As I said, South Korea was on, we were actually the Western part of Nigeria was ahead of South Korea and also was ahead of, was ahead of Malaysia because my father was the, was the advisor to the government of Malay, Malay Singapore, Singapore Federation. So I know that. So um, we were advising Malaysians in those days uh, because we had the skills. So uh, I would say we have not done well. We should have done better. Okay, is that okay for question number one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's very good. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. So if you. Hello. Yes, sir. Then um, you actually second. On... We can move to. We can move to question number two now, sir. Question number two. Two. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> As a professional in uh, and operator in the infrastructure value chain, speak specifically about your sector and the growth trajectory. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Well, I would say that uh, everybody who knows anything about economics knows that the first um, industry to suffer in a recession is the construction industry. Uh, likewise, the first industry to boom in, a, in an economic boom is the construction industry because it is the stuff of public officials to expand infrastructure whenever there's an economic boom. And when there's a downturn, the first thing that suffers is the construction industry. Um, so the value chain is such that since there's been an economic downturn, because we are a mono called mono economy, depending 100% on crude oil, 
for our livelihood, not even 90%, I would say 100%. The, I would say maybe, let's say, let, let me slash down to, um, well, you see, I have to be careful here because uh, the diaspora, the Nigerians in diaspora, yes, remit 25 to $30 billion every year. Oh. Uh, you know, so I, they used to. But even that figure has gone down due to the fact that a lot of them would have been affected by the economic downturn in the United States and Europe. So we have that problem as well. So I would say 75, 80% of our e e income is from crude oil. The other is from internal, uh, is from diaspora money. Okay, so yes. those have suffered a downturn. I mean, if you think about it, um, we're not borrowing for every single thing that we're doing, for the bridges, for the railway, for this and for that. And, um, and uh, obviously where we should be is not where we are. And I would say that as a professional and, the, and operator, uh, the, for my point of view as an architect, as a, in a top level, I would say that um, projects which were financed by oil companies and so on are no longer uh, as plentiful as they were. So if the oil uh, income is reduced, the only income we have basically is the income uh, from the diaspora, which itself inevitably will be reduced. So I would imagine that the uh, volume, uh, the value chain, which we should have, has also been affected um, in the last few years due to the oil um, price um, downturn. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, speak on your contribution in the growth trajectory either as a professional or investor in the sector. Okay. Now, I will talk specifically about my profession as an architect. Yes, sir. Um, because that's what I started my practice in 1976. And as I said, I was lucky when I came back, the country was an upward trajectory. So I have, we have plenty of projects. You're welcome to look at my, um, my uh, website, Um And you'll see the amount of work we've been doing since 1976. Let me repeat it again, www.tarikoka.com, all one word. Um, and you'll see the kind of work that we've been doing since 76. I, as I've trained over 150 architects wow. post-university post in my practice. Um, and I reckon I've done over 200 buildings, if not more. Wow. If you include the stint I had in government, which is four years as the Honorable Commissioner for Housing in Lagos State, 1999-2003, where I built 24,000 housing units in four years. So wow. if I include that, it's, it's quite a lot of buildings. So as I said, check my, um, check my, uh, you know, my website. Um, of course, as an investor, I did uh, invest early on in 1983. I built an apartment block. The first condo actually in Victor Island in 1983 was complete in 1985. Thereafter, we had lots of people copying, so I feel that I I brought something to the to the table. I also uh, had a particular style of architecture, which was com which was copied by my my uh, trainees, uh, my mentees, and also by my competitors. So I'm also happy to mention to you that I'm a published author. This is the second edition okay, of my book on housing policy dynamics. And, um, and uh, you know, this is second edition. It's also available online uh, through Amazon.com. Uh, I'm currently uh, finished the research for another book right now, or completing the research for a second book, this time on infrastructure. And that is going to be titled Infrastructure in Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, now the last, can I go on to the last question now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
uh, speak on your contribution to Abuja City from scratch. Okay, very interesting. Um, I started, as I said, I started my practice in 1976, Tari Coco Associates. And in 78, 77, 78, there was a competition for the planning of the new capital city in Abuja, which we entered my consortium, Tari Coco Associates, Neuhammert Stederbau of Germany and uh, Breder International. And we were one of the winning teams. It took several companies to, to plan a master, to do a capital city, not just one. So my company, Tari Cook Associates, uh, with Neuhammer Stederbau and Bredero won. As, and another company, Gulf Consultants, was given part of the federal city to, to, to plan. And so was uh, Tang, uh, Kenzo Tangi, the Japanese architect, and Oscar Nima, the Brazilian architect. So, um, and that was more or less, well, in fact, it was the biggest job I've ever done, actually. So, um, but that was because I was at the right place at the right time and I had the right yeah. combination of skills. Um, and in fact, there's a video which uh, I'll send you uh, if you're on WhatsApp. Are you on WhatsApp? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll use this number, your number. I'll send you a video of me uh, in 1980 being interviewed by the television company ITN of the United Kingdom. And so you see that it was recorded by the British, but never recorded by the Nigerians. So there we go again. I mean, it's who pay, who, who, he who dares win. <laughs> yeah. We have nothing on record from the Nigerian element. So we keep talking about this, that, this, that, but the fault lies invariably in our own now. And then on, whilst planning the capital city, we brought in people like um, Jean Deloigne, who was a Belgian landscape architect, and we uh, we built the Aboratrium, which you'll see when you drive into the um, Nikon oh. Nikon Hotel on the right. Uh, you wonder what's an Aboratrium. Aboratrium is a nursery for plants, so the plants can be re, can be nursed and regenerated and so on. Uh, you know, in order that they, they keep they keep re, rehabilitated rebuilt, rebuilt, or oh, sorry, rebranded, replanted. So we are all, all the time nursing these plants for future, for future planting. Um, that's what it's called, that's why it's called an aboratory. Um, and then of course, uh, we, I designed the, the first uh, hotel in Abuja, which is, which is called the Sheraton, but it's now called the Nikon Luxury Suites. Okay, it yeah. was originally called the Sheraton. I designed it as a Sheraton. Hello, sir. Your network went but uh... Hello. Hello, sir. I'm with you, sir. Yeah. Sorry, we we'll, I had to we had to reactivate uh, the generator. Yes. Sir. Yeah, that's part of your uh, infrastructural problem. So, uh, so we planned. Uh, we did the area eight Garaki. Um, and also I did the design the conference center, um, you know, the FCDA conference center. I planned the, I designed the World Bank, okay. uh, head office and residences, uh, which is a competition, which we won out of 110 local and international competitors and various other projects, you know, in and around Abuja, UAC head office and so on. So I would say Abuja was my biggest project ever. And my classmates in the UK never had that kind of opportunity. So in the 70s and 80s and 90s, through decades, I think Nigeria had a fairly steady growth. And I wish we had concentrated on railways instead of airports. Uh, because I, when I was, uh, for the one year I was an employee of McGregor Nawani when I came back from England, I was a project architect for uh, Maiduguri International Airport and Kano International Airport. Uh, whereas, um, sorry? Go on, sir. Speak on, sir. Whereas, um, whereas the Dutch um, consultants, Netherlands uh, consultants advised go on against building airports. He said they were not sustainable because airport travel was expensive. 
and that he should concentrate on building railways. And go on, you know, said, well, look, money is not my problem. So now we have airports which are hardly used. And how many people can actually afford to travel by, by air? Countries which have developed in the Western world, or even in China, communist countries like China and Russia, have always concentrated on rail. They're not stupid because you can carry more people and more load at an infinitesimally lower cost yes. than you would buy air. I mean, air is restricted. You've got to get fuel, you have to train pilots, you have to train cabin crew. There's a possibility of no flights or late flights. Air travel is really not the most suitable way of getting from point A to point B in any country. Look at Australia, look at the United States. You can travel from East Coast to West Coast United States by train. Same thing, India. India has a huge rail network. The UK, the, the colonizing power, has a fantastic rail network. You go to Australia, same thing. China, um, uh, Europe, Western Europe, Russia, everybody has a fantastic rail system. So we missed the boat as far as um, uh, expansion and development of Nigeria was concerned. So as far as I'm concerned, that was a, a big boo-boo by General Gowon. Right. So any other? Yeah, well, let me just give you, uh, your message to practitioners. And the My whole, message to what? To practitioners as, was, as Nigerians and the people celebrate. Well, <laughs> well one thing I would, I would certainly hope and uh, I was a member of Nigerian School of Architects, going back to your question number, as a practitioner, uh, question number two, Sorry, yes. I was a member, of a member of Nigerian School of Architects, professional body, and I was a chairman of the, <clears throat> I was a member of the, of the council. I was also chairman of the Public Relations Committee and the International Relations Committee. And uh, we found that Nigerian, officials, uh, official bodies like government were using uh, the, the, the services of foreign architects who were not registered in Nigeria. Um, we made a lot of fuss about it because it was taking jobs away from our colleagues, Nigerian colleagues. Um, and so the government brought in certain legislation, but guess what's happening now? Private sector operators are uh, bringing in, are uh, coming back and bringing back white South African architects and architects from Lebanon, all sorts of places who are not qualified to practice in Nigeria. So really, we find that uh, some, of our, some of these people are not even as well qualified as, some, as those of us who train in the UK, not to mention those uh, Nigerian architects who are up to the same standard. So we feel that um, the government, that's my message to, to the, 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 the professional bodies, should go back on the offensive and chase out all these uh, foreign architects. Because, I mean, I can practice in the UK because I trained in the UK. I'm qualified to UK, practice in the UK. I have the highest uh, academic and professional, highest professional, um, shall I say, highest professional qualification in yeah. the industry in the UK. I'm a fellow, I'm the first African to wow. being elected a fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So I can practice in the UK and anywhere in Europe because I'm, I've reached the height of that profession. And, that and I'm the only one from my class of 1964 in, in England, in the AA, who's been elected a fellow. And I thank the opportunities I had in Nigeria for that uh, singular honor. But, but I, I'm allowed to practice there because I trained there and I qualified there. I don't see why foreigners who did not train here or qualify here should be allowed to practice here. And that's been the, the, the kind of trend we've seen in the oil industry. I mean, I had battle upon battle with people like, I don't want to mention any oil companies' names here, but um, we won competitions, which we found that were never eventually um, exercised, uh, they were never built. Um, if you talk about Abuja, I can talk to you again about Lagos. The ExxonMobil um, 
residential complex was designed by me. That was a competition, by the way. Um, you know, Panosha head office was done by me. Arc Towers in Ligali Arundhati Street and Panosha was designed by me. AIB head office, all these buildings were designed by me. But all the time, most of the time, I was competing against foreigners. Uh, at least with the oil companies, uh, same thing with, I, as I said, I don't want to mention any names. Um, uh, to the extent that we found that we always compete against foreign uh, architects. And in the case of the World Bank head office in Abuja, that was a very interesting case because that was an, actually an international competition wow. uh, consisting of 110 local and international competitors. And I won that. Wow. So, so much for British training. So, you know, and I, that was another, I would say, one of the hallmarks, uh, highlights of my career. So my message to Nigerian professionals is keep at it and keep banging on the door and keep reminding government that you're around. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank Anyone? you. Yeah, thank you very much.